Real football, fake sounds. La Liga is set to return to your TV with crowd noise from past games pulsing through your speakers and new camera angles to bring you a little closer to the pitch. Plus the uh, latest transfer rumors regarding the long-term future of Paris Saint-Germain and Inter's Mauro Icardi and the more immediate future of Manchester United's Odion Igalo. And the biggest match in Germany has the stage all to itself today. Their classic are pitting uh, second place Borussia Dortmund against league leaders Bayern Munich. Will the Bundesliga title race end today? Welcome to Sport First. Hello, good morning, good afternoon, whenever you might be joining us. Thanks, as always, for sharing your time with us on Sports Burst. I'm Andres Cordero. Uh, joining me live on the show today, being sports contributors, Gary Bailey and Kaylin Kyle. Hello to both of you. And Kaylin, first off, congratulations to you and Harrison. Uh, you're expecting your second child. <laughs> Thank you. Incredible. Uh, yes, very, very happy uh, Well, now I have three child because <laughs> I consider my husband a child Go as well. Kaylin! So three in the family now. <laughs> yeah. I think in my household, my wife would agree with you. Uh, we are, by the way, potentially just 17 days away from the return of La Liga, uh, albeit with no fans in the stands. And today, uh, we're learning what that will look and sound like. The games will feature crowd noise recorded from past games. Uh, they would be the same sounds from those stadiums, and there would be new camera angles that would uh, conceivably uh, bring the viewers closer to the action on the pitch. So I'm curious with the two of you, we'll begin with you, Kaylin, uh, because you're a former pro, like Gary. What's the worst crowd that you ever faced if you could go back in time, hop into DeLorean, which crowd would you just eliminate from the stadium? I don't think it would eliminate it because I love fans, good, bad, or ugly, even if they're rooting against you. But Mexican fans, for me, are by far the most hostile that I've ever played in front of. Um, in Guadalajara and Mexico City, I've, I've played in both. I've played in front of them in Tijuana, everywhere, basically, because we've always had our CONCACAF tournaments either in Mexico or the United States. So um, definitely Mexican fans for me, but I love it. It gives me this energy, even though they're saying swear words in Spanish at me. I, I love it. It just gives me that energy and Gary I mean <laughs> Kaylin was you know a midfielder most of her career later on a defender so at least she could keep some distance between herself and the fans you were a goalkeeper you had to stay in that six yard box for the most part for you know 90 minutes plus <laughs> so I'm just curious what were the worst fans you encountered in your playing career the worst fans oh, it's got to be Liverpool uh, they hated us we hated them uh, when we arrived at the bus, walking from the bus to the dressing room, the locker room, we got covered in spit and all sorts of stuff. But, but during the game, you're right, it was even worse. You know, whenever the player was up at the other end of the pitch and I was down by the cop, they would throw everything at me. Empty bottles, sharpened coins, uh, whiskey bottles, always <laughs> empty. So there was never a chance of a quick drink. <laughs> and in fact, you know what? But the whole thing about a sweeper keeper uh, Kalen, where, you know, that was me. I was 20 yards away from the goal, so this stuff wouldn't hit me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so just curious, because we saw with the start of the Bundesliga, by the way, just reminding uh, the viewers, we are live and you're welcome to send us your comments, your questions. We'll get through as many of them uh, through the show as we can. In fact, uh, I believe Andrew Contura has already chimed in. Leave the fake noise out of it. It's nice to hear the communication between the players. And that's actually where I want to go next. So thank you uh, to uh, Andrew. Uh, Kalen, we saw the return of the Bundesliga at first was with no uh, sort of fake mat mm -hmm. sound, no, no crowd sound. Um, this past weekend, there was sound pumped through your speakers. Do you have a preference which is aesthetically more pleasing to you? Aesthetically, I like hearing fans because when I'm tuning into a match, in no disrespect to commentators, color commentators, I was one, but it's so nice to have the fans behind you. It's so nice to, you know, hear those tackles and when the, the camera's down pitch side, players yelling at one another. So it's a different aspect of it. I do like what, I, I don't know what his name was in the comment section, sorry, um, but saying he does love hearing the, the voices of the players, tactical changes within games that you might not hear with the fans. So I I like both sides of it, but as a former player, um, I, I do love listening to fans, whether it's fake or real. Um, if it's obviously behind closed doors and, and I'm a player without the fans, if I'm playing in games like that, um, it's maybe nice to be able to hear your players. But as, as a viewer now and not as a player, uh, I do like hearing the, the background noise. And Gary, to me, it's not just the sound of the, of the stadium and of the players, um, the coaches yelling 
uh, from the, the touchline. It's also the sound of the ball. I think when you hear that loud thud on a long on a long range shot or on a corner kick, that I wonder sort of whether we'll be missing that even subconsciously. Do you have a preference for fake crowd so uh, sounds or just the natural sounds of an empty stadium? Oh, huge preference for, for the sound of the fans. Absolutely. Those first couple of games, the week before mm -hmm. last, whenever it was that the Bundesliga started, it was, it was like that first game of a new season where you were playing a local team and nobody was there watching. And I just don't, I don't get excited by that. This, this recent match where Mainz were playing Leipzig, Leipzig won 5 0 and they, they switched the this, this sound on. It was brilliant. And Dre, you almost get conned because. Um, you don't get to see crowd shots that often so it almost feels like there is a crowd and your mind switches off you get excited by it the only thing that that threw me was minds were losing five nil at home and the crowd sounds were all <laughs> cheering and clapping and i'm thinking nah, yeah. that's that's not right they need to have a they need to have some booing in there as well <laughs> i could just imagine the uh the sound mm -hmm. engineer in the booth just finger on the dial ready to bring the sound up or bring it down depending on who scores and having to have that sort of awareness of whether the game is 5-0 mm -hmm. or 1-0. Um, I actually forget that the sound being pumped in is fake after a while. I think we're so conditioned to hear a game with that atmospheric mm -hmm. sound that you almost just completely forget that it's not real. And so I wonder if this is something that fans are opposed to because most of the comments have been anti-fake uh, crowd noise. For example, um, Bob Fickerman, no fake noise. Uh, I like being able to hear the players, the coaches yelling during the game. And I wonder if just the fact that we call this fake sound is what sort of makes you off the bat <laughs> opposed yeah. to it. But once it's actually underway, it's kind of quite pleasant, minute 25, 30, to not be reminded all the time mm -hmm. that it sounds like a training match, Kaylin. Yeah, Dre, I'm just going to, I'm taking your job at the moment, but I'm actually looking through the comments and it's so interesting. This is, I never even thought of this. Andrew Conturo, sorry if I pronounced your name wrong, but hearing the players communicate is something people who have never played the sport yeah. will help them understand how important communication plays as the game proceeds. Such an interesting one because as a player, I understand the game, I understand tactically, so that's such a cool point. But again, taking myself back to the player aspect of it, Gary, I do agree with you. They got to change something if you're up 5-0 and the fans are still cheering. Um, but that is such an interesting point and this is why I love being on Sports Burst because fans that watch the game that don't watch the game are commenting stuff like this that I wouldn't even think of because as a player I, I kind of I already know what's going on as an analyst you analyze the game but I do prefer the fans sorry I don't even remember what your question was Dre I just saw this and I was like "Ooh, I love that no, no worries uh, you referenced the comments I'll get through a few more of them uh, Daniel Lee Kome Jr. <laughs> says uh, fans are part of the game this will be odd to have games without fans uh, John Ice writes I would watch kids kick a bottle just because it's football don't really care about the fans uh, <laughs> yeah. Gary uh, let's go back if we could um, to the, the Bundesliga in particular the sounds are in German right so the the, the players are speaking German to, to one another yeah. how much of the communication are you really getting watching the Bundesliga with no fan noise With and me personally, none, because I have no clue what they're saying. I mean, I've got a sense that, that when someone's closing down a player and they shout something, they're probably shouting close down or kick the ball quickly or whatever, but, which is why it doesn't mean that much to me, the Bundesliga. If this was EPL, maybe I'd feel differently. But uh, you were saying a little bit earlier, Dre, that this is, or one of the, the sort of viewers was saying that this is fake noise. There's a saying, fake it till you make it. So if we, if we can't get fans in until we get fans in, <laughs> yeah. let's fake it. But it's better than doing nothing and hearing yeah. these echoing comments of the players mm -hmm. and coaches around these 80,000-seater stadiums. All right, let's hop on the uh, metaphorical transfer train mm -hmm. because the latest rumors from around the uh, world of European football um, deal with two players in particular. They're both strikers. We'll begin with Mauro Icardi because reports are suggesting that PSG and Inter are close to finalizing a deal that would see Icardi remain in Paris on a permanent transfer uh, for a fee of around $65 million, somewhere between 50, or rather 55 and $65 million. Icardi's wife uh, and agent, Wanda Nara, has reportedly negotiated a four-year contract for Icardi worth $11 million per. So, Kaylin, if you're Paris Saint-Germain, clearly you want to try and lower Mm -hmm. the uh, transfer fee as much as you can. But if it is in the region of 65 million, are you getting that deal done knowing that you're losing uh, Edinson Cavani at the end of the season for free? 
Yeah, and you just took the words right out of my mouth. Obviously, he's leaving. Then is Neymar leaving? Is Mbappe leaving? You need someone like Icardi coming in. And Inter know that. Inter are definitely not lowering this price because it's a bonus if they have him on the team. And if they get rid of him, it's huge money that they're going to receive. So Inter are in the driving seat at the moment. I wouldn't be lowering this at all. PSG need Icardi. He's gone there. He's a proven goal scorer. He's proven that he can play in the system of play with PSG. The fans are starting to like him. Players are able to play with him up top and that's a scary front three right now Mbappe Neymar Icardi um, so 100% if I'm Inter I am not lowering that I am sitting basically waiting for that check to be sent to me because PSG know that they need an Icardi with the amount of players that they could potentially be losing this next season and a half and Gary is Icardi potentially uh, I mean it's almost crazy to say this because Edison Cavani is the all-time top goal scorer for uh, PSG, but in some sense, I feel like Icardi's game, which is more of a penalty box predator, maybe a better compliment to playing alongside uh, Neymar and uh, Mbappe. So are you getting this deal done if you're PSG? Oh, absolutely, Dre, absolutely. This guy's a world-class striker. I mean, 55, 65, if you've gone mm -hmm. and spent 250 or something on Neymar, then I don't, think it's, I don't think it's a problem at all. And I'm just wondering if Icardi in signing doesn't, you know, has this feeling that Neymar is staying and Mbappe is staying because the price to, to buy them now, especially after COVID, is probably more than, than any club in, in the world can afford. Um, so if you're Icardi and you're thinking, well, I've got Neymar one side, Mbappe the other side, suddenly I'm looking at this going, hey, maybe this is the best front three in the world. And if they keep the rest of the team together, if you're Icardi, you might think, hey, I can, I can dominate with these players the way Barca have dominated for a long time. It must be a very exciting mm -hmm. project. And if I was Icardi, I'd sign the dotted line. If I was PSG, I'd pay the money. Let me uh, get through some of these comments here because people are chiming in about uh, Icardi and uh, this PSG Inter deal. Worth noting, by the way, that the loan move for Icardi included a buyout clause, but that was in the region of about 70 million Euro, so you're looking at about 75, 76 million dollars, um, and the, they're talking now about potentially 10 million less than that, which does hint at sort of transfer fees across the board all being reduced, even for superstar players, because you can't imagine a year ago that Icardi would be available to anyone for somewhere between 60 and 65 million dollars. Uh, Javen uh, Kurama writes, signing Icardi is the best thing that PSG did. I think bringing Mbappe over from Monaco and uh, Neymar from uh, Barcelona probably at least as good as bringing Icardi over from Inter. Uh, Brendan Burns, Icardi for 65 million <laughs> is a steal. Uh, he is a goal scoring machine. That he is, he just finds ways to score. Uh, and Clayton Brown writes, uh, mm -hmm. good deal for both Inter and PSG. So let's focus on the Inter side of that because if Icardi stays in Paris, Kalen, and Lautaro Martinez moves to Barcelona, where mm -hmm. does that leave Inter? The only other center forwards currently on the squad are Romelu Lukaku, who's quite good, and 17-year-old Sebastiano Esposito, mm -hmm. who's quite green. Uh, there are other reports claiming that Inter are interested in Edison Cavani. He could be available for free. And uh, RB Leipzig's Timo Werner, who would not be free and would not be cheap. So if you're Inter, what do you do post Icardi? Yeah, and that's it. You just you nailed it for me. If they end up selling these two players, they are going to go for a lot of money. So that means they can go out and buy players, buy players to make Inter better, buy maybe some younger players to bring them, or even I mean, Ica or Cavani. He has been a proven goal scorer. He might just need a little bit of a move from PSG because he's been in and out of the lineup there. Can he go to Italy? He'd be fantastic in Italy. So this is a great move for Inter. They're a fantastic team, one of the best teams in the world. Who wouldn't? want to go and play there it's such a desirable club to go play but the one thing if they can get rid of not rid of these two players obviously because they're fantastic players it just allows so much money in the bank account to go out and buy players to make your team better and maybe go a little bit younger right so my two players I mean uh, Icardi and Lautaro two center forwards will be going for for big money Gary um, what do you do if you're inter and you lose both of those players uh, is Cavani on a free, is that the right move or is that sort of a step back considering where he is uh, in his career? Um, and what about the po prospect of Timo Werner? We're all watching the Bundesliga uh, very intently right now. Timo Werner is outside of Lewandowski, pro possibly the best striker in the uh, German Bundesliga at the moment. Would he be a good fit for Inter? He would be a good fit, but I don't think they have enough money. I think the Liverpools of the world who are after him, the EPL has way more money than Inter have, even, even if they sell uh, Lotaro and obviously they get this money for Icardi. I think they have to spend it very wisely. 
Uh, maybe look for a different striker, Dre. I, I've, I've kept my eye on Victor Osiman at Lille. Mm. And I know a couple of EPL clubs have been looking at him as well. And he's a really good striker. And you put, you put him up front with Lukaku, mm -hmm. uh, two big, strong, quick players. Uh, you can create, you know, if you get the right combination at Inter, the rest of the team works hard. If you get the right person next to Lukaku, you could go on and win Serie A. But I just don't think Cavani is that player. If you get him on a free, mm -hmm. uh, keep him there, use him occasionally. But you need a younger, stronger player. I think Victor Osman would be a very, very good mm -hmm. investment for Inter or someone like that. Someone that has a future at the club. Um, but they have to spend this money wisely, Dre. You can get good deals now. Prices are coming down on players, so they can use all this money coming in. And as Kalen says, go out and get a few really good players. But you've got to choose wisely. That's uh, interesting that you bring up Victor Osman because mm -hmm. the other player we're going to be talking about here is another Nigerian striker, Odion Igalo, who may be forced to leave Manchester United. Gary, you're Manchester United before the season ends. Igalo actually might have already played his last game for the Red Devils. He's currently on loan from uh, Shanghai Shenhua. That loan expires at the end of the month. Uh, talks over extending that loan have reportedly broken down. And so if the Premier League starts in June, Igalo likely won't be a part of it. Uh, Gary, he's only been around since January, but he's already scored, what, four goals in, the Uni in United's last five games. How much might they miss Igalo if they can't uh, find a solution here? Well, they'll only miss him if, if Rashford's not fit. I mean, he, he came in at a time when Rashford was injured. He mm -hmm. took over that number nine role. He's the only other real number nine. Martial's a wide player. Daniel James is wide. Mason Greenwood maybe just sits a little bit off off the sort of number nine position so but the fact that Rashford should be fit for the start of the season if it does restart in a few weeks time I think they'll be okay if Rashford got injured then, then they would be short of a player but probably with you know with only a few games go to, uh, left to the end of the season it's not high on the critical list what is important Dre is who do they bring who they buy what other number nine is is there that's why I've mentioned Victor Osman because I think United have been looking at him as well you can't just have Rashford as your only true center forward and Rashford sometimes likes to play a little bit left or right as well so they can probably do without Igalo who's as you say scored a few very useful goals and, and been a great short-term acquisition they just need like Inter they need to take this opportunity to find the really good uh, bargain players and and sign them up for a good price and and make sure you've got the right player in the, in the right place for the start of the season. Uh, Kaelin do you agree how much might they miss uh, Igalo if they can't sort out a solution for this uh, loan extension? 100%. I completely agree with what Gary said. If Rashford gets injured, you have no one that can fill that role to be an out-and-out -out number nine goal scorer. They, they're trying to go with youth at Man United. They've had that rocky season, but kind of showed glimpse of, of greatness when Fernandez came into that midfield unit. So I do agree. Is he the right fit? Who knows, but I do agree that they need to sign someone just in case a Rashford goes down. It's the exact same thing that happened at Barcelona this season when Suarez went down. Who can come in to fill that role? I think the issue here is that we're talking about the end of the current season, right? When it returns and Igalo would not be allowed. This is actually a, a problem that we have been predicting for quite a while now that when the loan deals expire January 1st or the end of May, what do you do with these seasons that haven't been completed? And I think we're starting to see some of that some of those repercussions now with Manchester United potentially missing a, a piece that depending mm -hmm. on Rashford could be a key piece or an expendable one, uh, but they'll have no say in it because the deals were already signed and so they would need to find some sort of agreement with Shanghai Shenhua. Um, another comment here from Ariel Santos going back to the Inter thing. He says, he asks actually, I thought Inter were after Dries Mertens, question mark. I would wonder whether Mertens, who has been absolutely uh, terrific in his time at Napoli, was a good winger before then, but has been a, a, a sensational false nine at Napoli, excuse me, whether he can replicate that at another club. Um, because it was that sort of Maurizio Sarri system that first saw him branch out and become really an absolute Napoli icon now. And I don't know if he can replicate that at Inter. It's, it's actually a good question. Um, Bob Thickerman, who I read earlier, writes in, if Rashford stays healthy, Martial drops to number nine, uh, they won't miss him. Speaking of Igalo, uh, if he is hurt, then they would need him bad. And again, this is couple of weeks from now so at the end of the month that loan deal would have expired uh, yesterday we told you about Ashraf Hakimi's uh, potential return to Real Madrid this summer uh, the 21 year old again is on loan at Borussia Dortmund his agent confirmed that the plan was for Ashraf to return to the Bernabeu ahead of the 2021 rather 2020 2021 campaign but now Madrid based daily us are saying that uh, Real Madrid could allow 
um, Ashraf Hakimi to remain in Dortmund in hopes of gaining favor with the German club in a possible future deal for Erling Haaland. Now this, uh, Gary, is fascinating to me because in a world where even if transfer <laughs> fees are coming down, the ability for clubs to pay high transfer fees is also going down. Teams are going to try and find creative ways to sort of quantify value, right? And so one way, if you say, well, we don't have the money, at least we've been a good partner, that relationship between Borussia Dortmund um, and Real Madrid seems to be a good one. And so what should Madrid do in this scenario? Do you bring um, Ashraf Hakimi back because you need somebody to compete with Carvajal for that right back spot? Or do you leave him in Dortmund in hopes that that actually gets you a step closer to signing Erling Haaland in the future, Gary? Well, I, I guess they know that it's going to help them. I mean, they wouldn't be talking about it unless Dortmund had said, look, to be honest, we need uh, Hakimi, who's been fantastic this season for them. And if you let us keep Hakimi, then we'll look, we'll look kindly on future deals. So th they must have had that discussion. And to be fair, if you were to give me uh, Danny Carvajal or Hakimi now, I'd be like, I can see arguments for both. I like Carvajal's experience. I like uh, Hakimi's ability to get up and down that right side, that right flank. Um, I think they would they would end up mm -hmm. battling it out, and you you probably don't need that if you're Zidane. You probably look at, at Carver Hall and say, no, I'm happy with him for the time being. Hakim is in my plans long term, but if it's going to help us get Haaland, uh, I'll, I'll, I'm happy to leave Hakimi. That's fine until the day Carver Hall gets injured, and now you're bringing Nacho into an unnatural position, mm -hmm. and you haven't got any natural uh, right back there necessarily. So in that sense. It might come back to bite them, but if it gives them a better chance of getting Haaland, maybe it's worth a try. Kaelin, and actually that Haaland move would coincide with the end of uh, Karim Benzema's contract, unless they extend that. So is that maybe the route that uh, Florentino Perez and Real Madrid should take? Mm. Yeah, I don't think Benzema's going anywhere anytime soon, but I do love the move of Haaland to Real Madrid. He's been proven at Dortmund that he's just a fantastic player. He, I mean, he's just so good. He's lovely to watch. Um, whether you like him or not in interviews, I, I love him as a player. But I do agree with you with that, Gary. You, you nailed it. You said, will you bring him over to push a Carvajal? Well, Carvajal was injured. And like you said, Nacho had to step in for him and didn't do a great job this season. So you don't really have depth there. Carvajal's pushing 28. He'll be 29 soon, which isn't too too old for a player but why wouldn't you want to bring a young fiery fast he's the fastest player in the Bundesliga bring him back push Carvajal make them fight out for that position and then hopefully Holland will just come because it's Real Madrid you're gonna have to pay big bucks anyways for Holland so yes I, I do understand that you want to keep good relationship with the club to bring Holland over but at the end of the day money talks and Dortmund is a club that moves young players to big clubs and then develops youth again so Will they hold on to Holland? Probably not. They're going to sell him, but it's going to be for that big, big price ticket. And Real Madrid is one of those clubs that can afford to pay it. Okay, so we only have a few minutes left, and we have to talk about this because Germany's biggest match will have the stage all to itself today. It's a midweek Der Klassiker. Second place Borussia Dortmund hosting league leaders Bayern Munich. Uh, Dortmund, of course, will be without the famous yellow wall. No fans allowed at the stadium. Uh, Bayern have a four-point lead at the top of the table. So uh, what are you looking forward to in this one, Kaylin? Just a good, I mean, live football. Um, no, I, I just think it's it's an absolutely fantastic game, and and the points are so close. And, and a lot of people are saying if Dortmund wins or doesn't win this game, their title race is over. I completely disagree with that. I mean, it's Dortmund; they're absolutely flying. They got goal scores. Um, again, it, it's a different season now. It's behind closed doors. It's with no fans, so it's literally anyone's game. It's going to be a good match today. I'm gonna put my money. Gary, can we have a little bet today? I'm going. I can't drink wine at the moment, but I'll let you take me for dinner. If I get this match right, I'm going Dortmund 2 0. Gary, you're free to respond to that. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Kaylin, I'm impressed. All right. So that's the deal. So I'll take you and your hubby out if, uh, if, if you're right. Um, so you're going, you're going Dortmund to win. I'll go Bayern. I just think they're, uh, they're too good, too well organized. Muller, Lewandowski, they've got pace at the back. They're Alfonso Davis, by the way. Oh, what a player he is. Um, yeah, of course, Dortmund have Jaden Sancho and him. one or two that, that, that like Haaland that, that on their day can be good. But I just, what's that? Sorry? 
Well, guys, it's, just, it's worth noting that... I'm going Thailand? against my Canadian. I hate myself for that, but I'm yeah. going to do it today. A dormant win... You uh, are, you are. Then, then you're going to pay for this, Kaylin. I'm going with Bayern Munich. All right, fair enough. Uh, just to... to <laughs> I know. You will. Watch. Mark my words. Just to I'm clarify here, it. a dormant win would essentially bring them to within <laughs> one point with six rounds left. Um, however, a Bayern win would move them seven points clear. Um, so just very quickly, is today the last day of the Bundesliga title race? Gary, we already heard from Kaylin. She said no, even if Dortmund lose. So for you, is it today the end of the uh, Bundesliga title race? Oh, if Bayern win, it's all over. Seven, seven points, six games to go. A team that's never lost at home this season. There's no way they drop seven points. A draw, four points, it's still on. But I, I hope, and well, I've gone for Bayern to win. I hope Dortmund do win because it then brings Leipzig into it. It brings München Gladbach into it. It gives us all a, a much more mm. exciting end of the season. So as fantastic as Bayern are, I think for, for most of us, we want to see this go right down to the wire. So uh, actually, I'll be happy, Kaylin, if I lose the bet to you and Dortmund win, just, just to see a, a great end to the Bundesliga season. Again, you're, just, you're excited to take me for dinner, be honest, all right? <laughs> uh, Kaylin made that bet now because she knows the restaurants are closed. And you're anyway. happy. I've got to congratulate your hubby as well. <laughs> right. So that's going to do it for this edition of uh, Sports First. Thanks to Keelan Kyle and to Gary Bailey. Thanks to you at home for uh, watching and for sending in your questions and comments. Be sure to join us tonight at 7 p.m. Eastern for Sports First PM.